And as I was saying, this is also an important problem because uh, you know, this, is, this is applications for quantum state preparation, for adiabatic algorithms, and all of that stuff. Okay. All right. So before getting too deeply into this subject, I want to give you a little bit of an overview about quantum phase transitions, focusing particularly on second order or continuous quantum phase transitions. Okay. So the nice thing about continuous quantum phase transitions is that they can be characterized by universality classes. So we don't need to worry about the microscopic details of each individual system. But by and large, a second order phase transition is essentially an avoided crossing. As you tune some control parameter in your system, so here I call that F, there is a gap which usually vanishes at the quantum critical point, And it vanishes with this characteristic combination of exponents, which is written conventionally as z times nu. And there is a correlation length which diverges at the quantum critical point, And it does so with this characteristic correlation length exponent, which is called psi. And the nice thing is that we today have nearly 50 years of technology called the renormalization group. So once we, we know very well how to calculate these core critical exponents and we can understand all the properties of the system in the vicinity of the quantum critical point. So then the question becomes, how do we actually go and measure these exponents experimentally? And the way to do that conventionally is via the so-called quantum cable Zurich mechanism. So the mechanism says that when, when, suppose you're tuning some parameter of your system, which I call here GF again, okay? And without loss of generality, let's assume that I'm varying that parameter linearly, okay? So initially, my system, just as I tune my parameter, my system follows adiabatically. But once I get close to the quantum critical point, my gap vanishes. Or in other words, my relaxation time diverges, or, and the system cannot keep up with the changing parameter. And at some point, it falls out of equilibrium. So kibble zurich says that once it falls out of equilibrium, the system totally freezes. There are no further dynamics in this regime, which is called this impulse regime. And as a result of this freezing out, the kibble zurich hypothesis states that the correlation length that you froze in on the left-hand side before crossing the quantum phase transition is the correlation length that you recover after you unfreeze on the other side of the quantum phase transition. Okay. And this naturally, this freezing out naturally leads to a result that if you measure the density of defects or you measure the characteristic length scale of ordering, that follows this characteristic combination of exponents. Okay? All right. But the kibble zurich um, uh, hypothesis is an approximation because in reality there are significant dynamics when the system is going through the phase transition. It does not freeze when it falls out of equilibrium. Instead, there's actually a non-equilibrium correlation length that continues to grow with time as we vary this parameter of, of the system. All right? And this has been recognized in specific instances. So there's a paper by Zurich himself. But all of these um, studies, they focus on individual models that you can solve, say, like the transverse field Ising model in one dimension, or you look at like a large N, ON field theory. But they're very specific, and, in, and the results depend on what you're exactly considering. Okay. So what we've set out to do is to develop a universal theory that does not care about the microscopic models so much and applies universally to all systems. Okay. And this beyond kibble zurich physics is what we term coarsening. Okay. So coarsening is actually a very old phenomenon in classical physics. Uh, so metallurgists are very familiar with this. So if you have a binary alloy, and which is undergoing spinodal decomposition, the late stages of that is what we call coarsening or Oswald ripening in classical language. But the basic idea is that a system quenched from a disordered phase to an ordered phase does not order instantly. Okay? Instead, there is a length scale that continues to grow with time as different symmetry-broken ordered states compete to select the correct equilibrium state. So here is a very classical example uh, where I'm showing the dynamical evolution of a system, which is just a classical Ising model as a function of time. Okay? So black you can think of as like spin up and white as spin down, but this is completely classical. And now we track the evolution of the system and look at what happens. Okay? And you can see that the white domains tend to aggregate, the black domains tend to aggregate, and the domains get larger in size. Okay? What these pictures also kind of indicate is that the domain growth is a scaling phenomenon. So the domain patterns at late times look statistically self-similar to the ones at early times, apart from a global change of length scales. OK, so this was classical. We understand that very good. 
So how do we deal with this coarsening phenomenon in a quantum system now? All right. So I'm going to consider a very generic setup where I have two phases, a what we call a disordered phase and an ordered phase, as a function of some tuning parameter, which I now label G. So sorry for going from F to G. Okay. Uh, and the only, on the x-axis is the tuning parameter, and on the y-axis I'm plotting the energy density. Okay? And the only assumption that I'm going to be making is that after crossing the quantum phase transition, on the ordered side, there exists a finite temperature or finite energy density phase. Okay? This is a very common situation. All right. So generically, we're going to be interested in a ramp where we start in some easy-to-prepare initial state. That is what you would do in nearly every quantum simulation experiment, analog experiment at least. Uh, it's also what you do for adiabatic quantum computing. And then we ramp the parameter, and this traces out the path in this energy density parameter space. Okay. All right. So initially, the system is evolving adiabatically. But when the system is within this quantum critical regime, it undergoes a small amount of what we call quantum critical coarsening. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that if my system is defined by some non-equilibrium correlation length, which I call L here, that correlation length grows with time as a power law, as t to the 1 over z, and that z is the same dynamical exponent as the one at the critical point, okay? at the quantum critical point. Then, if my ramp continues, we enter deeper into the ordered phase, and then we cross over into a regime of what I call non-critical coarsening. Okay? So non-critical coarsening is a different flavor of coarsening where the length scale continues to grow with time as a power law. But the exponent that you see there, ZD, that has got nothing to do with the exponent of the quantum critical point. Okay? It's got to do with what is conserved, what are the symmetries of the model, and that's what governs those exponents. And crucially, like ZD is greater than Z. Now, the, so far I've been talking about a ramp that continues without end, but what if we stop the ramp, okay? So one scenario that we can get is what I've already outlined. You can have quantum critical followed by non-critical coarsening, but there could be other interesting scenarios. So one option is to stop the ramp at or near the phase boundary, this thermal phase boundary, which we assume is critical, and then after quantum critical coarsening, you can have a small bit of, non, uh, of classical critical coarsening, which is governed by a totally different exponent, which is I denote by z bar. Okay. So now I understand that uh, this, I've introduced many different flavors of coarsening, three to be precise. But the nice thing is that's it. So every ramp protocol can be understood from a combination of these three building blocks. Okay. And so we can stop the ramp at different positions. So for instance, if I stop right at the phase boundary, this classical critical coarsening can go on without end. If I inject too much energy density, then I stop in a regime where I'm not even in the ordered phase, and then I'll equilibrate to the disordered phase, and there can be different scenarios. So, but uh, even if like, the details are confusing, what I want you to take away is that any ramp you can do, it, it can be very fast, it can be very slow, any ramp has to fall into one of these five categories. And if you understand how these five categories behave, you can understand all your dynamics across the quantum phase transition. All right. So I don't want to get into too much of the details, but I want to give you a flavor of it. And the way we tackle this problem, we understand these scenarios, is by, by writing scaling functions. Okay? So the scaling hypothesis says that at late times, there is a single characteristic length scale in your system so that everything looks self-similar if you scale by that length scale, all right? So consider, for simplicity, a ramp that goes on without stopping, okay? So then, by the scaling hypothesis, it turns out that I can write this non-equilibrium correlation length as a number, which is my kibble zurich length, times a function that's universal, okay? And this function I'm parameterizing by a variable, which I call t over t kibble zurich And this is my, going to be my scaling argument, okay? So there, there are three regimes that we can consider for the scaling variable. One, when x is much smaller than minus one, that's the adiabatic regime. Then I have a regime of quantum critical coarsening, and then I have a regime of non-critical coarsening. So what does the scaling function actually look like? It's very simple. So when you're, if you can follow my mouse, so when x, when I'm in the adiabatic regime, 
It just has to follow the equilibrium correlation length. When I'm in the quantum critical regime, what happens is that my system, even though I'm near criticality, my system is heated up. So there's really nothing singular. So the correlation length evolves smoothly without any singularities. And finally, the interesting thing is that at late times, I cross over to a regime with a growth that's much slower than what I would have on the left. Okay. So there's much rich physics that you can uncover. Uh, I will not get into the detail, but you can read about it in our paper if you're interested. The last case that I will mention just before I transition to experiments is that in an experiment, you're not going to continue a ramp for infinite time. That's only what a theorist would do. You have to stop the ramp at some point. And when you stop the ramp, that actually introduces another time scale into the problem, which is the stopping time. But that's it. So with these two parameters, which is the t, the time itself, and the stopping time, you can parameterize any ramp. And no matter what you do going across the phase transition, it is captured by this universal function that depends on two variables. Okay. All right. So that's enough theory, perhaps. Uh, but let me just summarize the key predictions of this theory. So, of course, there will be dynamics beyond Kibble Zurich given by coarsening. These dynamics are universal, so they will exhibit self similarity. What I haven't shown you, but I will show in experiments, is that the coarsening dynamics, this is a prediction of the theory, they actually get faster as we approach the quantum critical point. Uh, and also, if you look at the microscopics of what's going on, you can see that these dynamics are actually being driven by domain wall curvature. Okay. So let me make all of this concrete by telling you how we'd actually go about probing these in experiments. So the platform that we are going to use are neutral atom arrays. You've heard a few talks about this already in this conference. Uh, but if you're unfamiliar, the idea is just that we have a system where we have neutral atoms and optical tweezers. Each atom can be in either in the ground state or they can be in a very highly excited Rydberg state with a large principal quantum number. And this is, th these two ground and Rydberg states defines my qubit with which I'm going to perform my analog quantum simulation. So a very quick recap of the Rydberg physics that some of you have already heard. So when two atoms are excited to the Rydberg state, they interact very strongly via this one over r to the sixth interactions. And as a result of this, there's a very interesting effect which appears. Okay? So if I just have one atom that's driven by a laser, it can rob you oscillate between the ground and the Rydberg state. But now if I bring two atoms close together, because of this Rydberg-Rydberg interaction, the state where both of the atoms are in the Rydberg state gets driven out of resonance and cannot be occupied. So this leads to the phenomenon known as the Rydberg blockade, which says that the excitation of one atom to the Rydberg state prohibits the simultaneous excitation of nearby atoms to the Rydberg state. And you can see that you know, this blockade effect immediately leads to very strong correlations in the system. So the many-body Hamiltonian looks something like this. So we have uh, omega, which is a Rabi frequency that drives between the ground and the Rydberg state. You can think of it as a transverse field. We have delta, which is the laser detuning. And you can think of this as the chemical potential for the Rydberg state. And then, of course, you have the important Rydberg-Rydberg interactions. And it's not difficult to see that if I'm working in two dimensions, say I'm working on the square lattice, uh, the simplest possible state, the simplest possible ordered state that I can write down uh, consistent with this Rydberg blockade is this nail ordered state or the checkerboard state. All right. So given this uh, background, we set out to study this experimentally in collaboration with Michel Lucas groups. So the experimental results that I'm going to show you were performed by uh, Tom Manovitz and Sophie Lee, who are in the audience. So you can ask them all the experimental questions. Uh, but essentially, the idea is very simple. You start off in a state where everything is in the ground state, uh, in a disordered state. And then you ramp up your detuning. You enter the ordered phase. And you watch the domains grow as a function of time. So specifically, the ramp protocol looks something like this. So you ramp up your detuning. And then we hold for some time and watch the evolution of the correlation length during this hold time. And you can see very nicely in this figure over here that the correlation length as a function of this hold time does grow. And it grows by a factor of two or two, two and a half in this data. And that is in stark contrast with what Kibble Zurich would predict. Kibble Zurich would say you froze in and that's it, end of story. But here we're seeing a drastic growth in correlations which actually are important for the final state. And not only that, 
you can, if you look at the squared correlation length of the function of the whole time, at least the early time growth is consistent with the linear exponent, which is exactly what we would also predict from the theory. So we can take a look at this more microscopically as well. And here what we are looking at is the total en uh, energy of the system. And we are asking how does this energy get redistributed between these domains and the bulk as the coarsening progresses. So what happens as you coarsen is that you have domain walls. And those domain walls get eliminated as, you move, as your system coarsens. But that energy has to go somewhere. And what that energy goes is that it shows up as single spin flips within the bulk of a large domain. So of course, your energy has to be conserved. But you can see that there's a redistribution of energy between the bulk of the domains and the domain walls. And that's what drives the coarsening microscopically. So now, how do we say, that, how can we certify that, these, uh, that, that this coarsening is actually driven by quantum fluctuations? Well, here we were aided by a very nice experimental advance which is that now we can prepare seeded domains. So what I mean by that is suppose I consider an array which is prepared in a state where on the outside, this dark blue region, I have one type of nail order. And in the central domain, I've seeded it with a domain of the other order. Okay, so there are two checkerboard states. The outside has one checkerboard state. The inside has another checkerboard state. Okay. And I, we can do this experimentally now. And then we observe what happens as a function of time. Okay? So of course, you know, as the coarsening progresses, the domain walls tend to melt away. And you can see that in the experimental data as well. But here, this is data for one value of the detuning. Okay? So I can crank up my detuning and then ask what happens. And you can see that I go to larger and larger detunings. These dynamics get slower and slower. This is over the same time scale. And you can see that the melting is much slower in this case than in here. So what's happening is precisely what I predicted earlier, that these dynamics speed up as we approach the quantum critical point, and they slow down as we go further away from it. And in fact, this is a visual picture, but you can also look at this more quantitatively. So for instance, if I look at the area of the largest domain as a function of time, you can see that it decays faster for closer to the critical point than away. And in fact, this decay, if I look at the rate at which it decays, that also Again, theoretically, it's expected to have a, have a scaling form with the precise exponent given by the critical exponents of the Ising model here. And we do see behavior that is consistent. Uh, in this. Okay. So the last thing that I want to show is, again, a very microscopic view of how the coarsening progresses. And I mentioned theoretically we know that the coarsening proceeds by the reduction in the perimeter of domain walls. So domain, there's excess energy which is localized in the domain walls. And our theory tells us that the rate of coarsening is proportional to the local curvature of the domain walls. And as these domain walls get eliminated, they get straightened out. Okay? So we can look at this microscopically. Again, beautiful experiments. Uh, we've seeded it with a domain wall which is of this zigzag shape and watch how it melts. But not only globally, we can watch this melt across different cuts in the system. So for instance, here we have four different cuts labeled by four different colors. And you can see that for a cut, say, for instance, this blue cut, which is localized at the peak of the zigzag pattern, where there's a lot of local curvature, you can see how the, cut, how the domain shifts as a function of time. So you can see that this boundary, it moves rightwards as a function of time as the boundary wants to straighten out. Okay? Similarly, the opposite boundary moves leftwards. But interestingly, if you look at somewhere in the center where there is hardly any local curvature, these boundaries are relatively stable over time, and they don't move. And then perhaps a more striking example of that, which you can see visually, is that suppose I eliminate all curvature altogether, and I just seed a perfectly straight domain wall. You can see that, again, over comparable time scales, this boundary does not move at all. It's remarkably stable. So all of this experimental data is in perfect is in maybe not perfect, but very good agreement with numerical simulations, which we have in a paper, but I didn't show here because experiments are much nicer to look at. All right. So with that, I hope I've given you a flavor for why uh, condensed matter theorists are very excited about quantum many-body dynamics uh, and studying that with quantum simulators. It's a really powerful probe, which perhaps 
you know, we didn't have access to previously. Um, and hopefully I've convinced you that this is, there is a subtle interplay of quantum coarsening and cable Zurich mechanism, which had previously not been identified. Um, there are multiple types of coarsening which can occur. Um, there's classical critical coarsening, there's quantum critical coarsening, there's non-critical coarsening. But even if you forget about all these different flavors, you forget about the details, what I would like you to take away is that no matter how you're going across the quantum phase transition, there is a two-parameter universal scaling form that applies to your system. Irrespective of what your microscopics are, there is a function that will describe how you, your dynamics as you go across this phase transition. Uh, and besides these very nice experiments from Misha's group that I showed you, there were also, Tron talked earlier this morning about these hybrid digital analog experiments. And there also, they were able to verify many of the predictions that we made in our theory paper. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. And I'll welcome you to lunch. Thank you very much, Ryan. And uh, thank you for shifting your talk to earlier to today. So we'll be able to leave a slightly earlier uh, at the end of the day today. Um, uh, so questions? So when, when you're drawing these ramps in the first half of the talk, should I understand that as you're, you're trying to drive this uh, quantum phase transition at zero temperature, but because of the closing of the gap and non-adiabaticity, you go up sort of in the up direction in this graph? Is that, that correct? That's exactly the correct interpretation. We are falling out of equilibrium, so the, the system is heating up, and that moves me up in the vertical direction in the energy density plane. Yeah. Okay. And I have just one more question. If I can. Um, in these experiments... Did you observe anything um, that's like in, inherent to uh, um, quantum coarsening or dynamics? Yeah. The fact that the dynamics speed up as we approach the quantum critical point is a striking signature of quantum critical coarsening. In fact, if you approach the, if it's classical critical coarsening, which occurs near the thermal phase boundary, the dynamics should actually slow down as you get closer to that boundary. I see. Other questions? Theoretically self-similar because of the universality of the, of the beyond Kibble-Zurich model that you assign. Um, did you actually observe that experimentally? I might have missed it, but was there a, a graph or a plot or something that would yeah. show the fractal structure? Yeah, great. So the question is, do we observe this predicted self-similarity experimentally? And I would say yes, but with a caveat. Okay. So self-similarity is best seen via data collapse. And experimentally, we observe some version of data collapse. It's just that we need an extra scaling parameter to account for experimental decays with time. Okay. But we ha do have, I would say, quasi-signatures of self-similarity, if not exact self-similarity in the experiment. Happy to show you data later if you'd like. Any other questions? All right. Uh, I think we're all ready for lunch, it looks like. So let's thank, thank Ryan you. again.